Hi, I'm Stephen James with Uva Imports. We have three very exciting wines to share with you today. Uh, the first video is going to be of Paolo De Maria. He is the winemaker at the De Maria Winery along with his brother Aldo. Uh, they have a brand new wine called Luigi. It's a Pet Nat Rosato style, blend of Arnais and Nebbiolo. Uh, the second video is more of an educational video uh, I'm presenting two different wines to my friends Phil and Laura. The wines are Pereira Garona's Rosé, it's called Finn Rose, and Santa Catarina's Grinolino de Asti, uh, called Arlandino. I hope you find these videos uh, educational and fun, and I hope you have a bottle of wine to drink along with us as you watch. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Today I want to introduce Luigi our Rosato Petnat wine. Petnat is the shorthand for Petillan Naturel, a natural sparkling or a Metodo Ancestrale. Our Luigi is 70% Arnaise and 30% Nebbiolo. The two grapes have been harvested from our organic vineyard and together they are vinified like a white wine without skin maceration. The fermentation is spontaneous with native yeast in steel tanks and is bottled before fermentation is completed. This is the reason for the natural carbonation and sediments that remain inside the bottle. The beautiful rosé color comes from Nebbiolo grape and the bubbles are vibrant with a fine prolage. The bouquet recall yeast, bread crust, flour and fruity note. The wine is dry, orange blossom, mandarin peel and some red fruit like raspberry, cherry. There's a nice acidity, the wine is very fresh, pleasant, with a light tannin at the end. The bubble make this wine perfect as an aperitivo or for some fatty, salty food, like hamburger, fish and chips. For a unique project, we create this playful label that reflect our vision to create something fun, new and different. Salute! The next wine we have here is, uh, this is an image of Poreri Garona. Uh, this is the major vineyard that is on their property. Uh, they have just about three hectares, uh, about six acres of vines planted here in the Boca region, which is very unique in the, what they call Alto Piemonte, the northern part of the uh, Piedmonte region. Uh, this DOC of, of Boca is the highest DOC in all of, of Piedmont, and it's on an ancient collapsed volcano, uh, which really gives these wines distinction. Uh, so excited to have these wines in the U.S. for the first time, and we're tasting the rosé today that just landed. Um, I am just mad about this Finrose rosé. The Finrose, the name comes from the fact that this is grown inside a national park, Parco Naturale Monte Finera. Um, the Mount, Mount Finera is uh, this uh, national park, which includes this, uh, these archeological sites. Not only did they find one of the Neanderthals here, uh, but also this ancient volcano was formed when Europe and Africa collided to create the Alps. Uh, and so it gives you this uh, beautiful picture of uh, what happened here many, many uh, years ago. And this wine region is coming back from near extinction. The total hectares planted here for Boca is 25 hectares uh, and growing, but it used to be over a thousand before Phylloxera and before the World Wars and the Industrial Revolution, which really sort of derailed uh, wine making production, especially for indigenous varietals in Italy. And speaking of indigenous varietals, uh, this is the famous Piedmont grape Nebbiolo. It's blended with Vespolina, 
Vespolina adds this wonderful, bright, uh, elegant floral component and just a touch of uva rara. Uva rara is a part of the Bernarda family, uh, which is uh, a unique strain of the uva rara grape is here in Boca. Uh, Phil, you have, I believe, the Finrose Rosé from Papaya Garona in front of you. Uh, this is- I do. Fantastic, yep, there it is. Um, so real quick, uh, we have a map here. This is the Piedmont, a close up. If you're familiar with the Piedmont at all, then you know Barolo and Barbaresco. Uh, Barolo down here in the bottom. Uh, Barbaresco is here in this uh, jumbled mess of different regions in the south. But way up here where you see a lot less going on, Boca is here in the, uh, the gray. And even though the DOC for this rosé is the Colline Navaresi, which is the, uh, the red outline here, this is the Colline uh, Navaresi, uh, the, all the fruit for this uh, wine is coming from within Boca and from a very old vin vineyard planted in 1974. Uh, Phil, what do you think of the rosé? How's it showing? Oh, it's beautiful. Um... I feel like we've been talking about this wine for for a long time. Uh, you know, we've been carrying the the red Boca from from Poderi Garona for a few months now. Um, but we've, I, I think, from the, from the get go, that what was most exciting, uh, you know, not most exciting, but but was definitely exciting for you was the the rosé. Um, but I, I still can't quite believe that they're making rosé off of this beer that is uh, is so rare and 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 such small quantities it's kind of uh, kind of amazing um and and the wine uh doesn't disappoint um super um soft and and elegant um has it has it of course great minerality and and acidity and freshness due to the, the high elevation um it's got this kind of like um watermelon rind white strawberry you know not nothing overpowering um uh, but but just food friendly and and really really delicious. You know, um, in the bottom corner here, you have uh, you have Renzo Duela. It's his family's vineyards uh, that create this wine. And in uh, you know his his broken English and, and my really bad Italian, um, I didn't quite understand why he said it's a very small vineyard that uh, makes this rosé and why he needed to make rosé with it. He was saying something, explaining to me that it doesn't, it wasn't um, quite what it needed to be to be the red wine, but it, I didn't quite understand the, the justification. But anyway, <laughs> the uh, food pairings, what do, you, what, do you, what do you, what do you, when you taste this wine, what do you want to eat? Um, you know, definitely, um, I think, uh, something, something salty and, and even again, uh, like the Prosecco in that it has the acidity and, and freshness to, to, um, pair well with something that's a little more, more fatty. Um, you know, I think, uh, rosés are the, I mean, they're, they're so versatile. They can pair with, um, such a variety of, of, uh, protein from poultry to fish to um to even some you know um uh, pork and uh and even full, fuller bodied roses can with with uh, red meats but uh but you know i i think this one would be great with with uh some heartier seafood um you know even even uh, raw oysters would be fantastic that salinity and minerality really come out um but yeah, I, you know, this one to me is not one to, to overthink when you're uh, when you're when you're debating pulling the cork uh, with a meal because it's gonna probably go with just about anything. Awesome. Yeah, for me, like uh, shrimp and grits could be really fun with this for sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like you said, rosé is probably the most uh, table friendly, versatile style of wine. When I go to dinner parties and people are like bring a bottle of wine, I'm like, if I'll ask, well, what are you cooking? And they're like, well, we're just gonna have this and that. You know, people are bringing different things. I'm like, all right, I'm bringing rosé. Uh, especially one with good structure like the Fin Rose. Well, this is going to be a new experience for everyone who tastes this wine. This wine has never been available in the U.S. before. Uh, so super excited to get feedback on these wines. Hopefully people will enjoy this new uh, rosé from high elevations and the northern Piedmont 
from Vespolina, Nebbiolo, and Uvarara. The next wine we have here is uh, our red wine of the evening. And uh, the first thing to notice here is these beautiful vineyards uh, across from where this picture is being taken. You see the diamonds cut into the, the hillside. Um, Guido Aleva is the owner of Tenuta Santa Catarina. Uh, and as you'll notice, what else is very telling about this property is the bottom of the hill, you see the lake, little lake down here, uh, is green. There's no vineyards in the flatlands. They only use the south, southeast exposed hillsides for their vineyards for maximum sun exposure uh, to get maximum ripeness in the grapes. Uh, this is a very fascinating history and story. Um, here to zoom in on the southern part of uh, the Piedmont, which can get a little uh, you know, congested here. Uh, this here area, just to the north and to the east of Asti, the town of Asti, probably most famous for Moscato de Asti, uh, is actually home to some very important vineyards uh, and many different grape varietals. Here we're tasting Grinolino, the grape varietal here. Uh, Grinolino, the root of this word, uh, stems from potentially two different sources. One, the uh, word referencing the pithiness of the grape because it has a higher concentration of seeds in the grape. You can get a little more astringency and acidity in the wine. Uh, and also the green, the root word for Grinolino is also referencing a ancient Italian word uh, meaning to grimace uh, because the, the tartness of the fruit, the acidity, uh, you know, gives that puckering flavor character, uh, especially if it's not grown on perfectly exposed hillsides, which in most parts of Italy, here in the Piedmont, the, this grape got replanted to Nebbiolo or Barbera, which were more popular and could fetch higher prices. It's people like Guido at Santa Catarina that are bringing these indigenous varietals that were on the fringe back to the forefront. And he's uh, spared no expense to make some of the best quality wines from Grinolino uh, without the huge markup. Uh, so as you can see on this uh, slide, the Benedictine Abbey, which is the basement here, the cellar of this winery, is, uh, was built in 961 AD. Um, a lot of history here. Uh, and they are an up and coming winery. They recently won as a merging winery from the Mambero Rosso and their higher end Grinolino uh, won the Trebicari Award, which is the highest award in, uh, in Italy. Uh, this photo here is uh, uh, Julia. This is uh, Guido's uh, daughter opening a bottle. Uh, Laura, you have the, uh, the Grinolino da Asti in front of you? I do, this beautiful bottle here. Um, so for me personally, um, this was the first Grinolino I had ever had the opportunity to experience, and it really has me excited about this grape variety as a whole. Um, right off the bat, nose-wise, what strikes me is just all of the kind of um, floral notes you get has this cool herb thing going on and so much red fruit. I mean, raspberry, cranberries, things along those lines. Uh, and then what I love about it is the kind of more, has kind of a rustic feel to it, which I feel kind of goes along with the story behind it and the fact that it is just such um, a time old varietal coming out of the area. And, and it speaks to just the beauty that can exist if they, um, put it in the right spots. Indeed. The, the, this wine after Phylloxera uh, devastated the vineyards. Um, this, uh, this wine took a back seat and became uh, a wine because it, where it was left in these uh, less uh, ideal vineyards, they became very light pressed, very delicate tart wines. And this is, this Green Alino, especially for this price point, um, this Grinolino has more fruit and more depth and more texture than just about anything I've tried out there. That being said, in the state of Georgia, there's only a few examples of Grinolino available. Uh, this has been uh, received with a lot of, of uh, success and attention. I opened one last week 
and was like like you and really impressed by this bright rat, red raspberry fruit uh, straight out of the gate. But I also left half of this bottle for and uh, drank it two days later. And the secondary flavors of leather, sort of dried tobacco leaf, all these tertiary flavors, these earthy notes had come alive. And the wine was just so compelling having been open for two days. Uh, it's definitely a wine you could decant and watch it sort of breathe and expand as it opens up. And it shows off some of its uh, little more mature elements that are still uh, to have developed in this very young wine. It's an unoaked style, uh, which helps kind of retain that fruit character. Uh, I had it last Saturday night with a rotisserie chicken, uh, some asparagus uh, with mashed potatoes and gravy, and it was perfect. You think about turkey uh, at cranberry sauce at Thanksgiving, anything that you would like that like cranberry note or these tart red fruit components. I mean, even, even a charcuterie plate with your fattier you know, cuts of, of pork. I love a good uh, you know, jam on the side, something but nothing too sweet. And uh, this kind of takes the place of some sort of added, you know, uh, dried fruit character. And it, uh, the general structure of it is always so impressive as well, because I feel like a lot of the things we've described kind of come across as lighter, you know, red fruits, herbs, things like that. But it has this grip and depth on the palate that I feel like could stand up to heavier dishes too. Indeed, for sure. Yeah. A, a roast would be great. Yeah, I was going to... I was going to comment about that wine because the tannic structure, you know, this, this is one of the few wines that really makes me, I mean, not few, but you know, it's, it's a wine that really makes me think about terroir and the sense of place and the fact that, you know, I always associate those abundant, but fine grain tannins with um, Barbaresco and Barolo and Nebbiolo based wines. But this wine has that kind of similar um, tannic structure. And, um, and it, you know, uh, Grignolino, of course, probably not too far off from, from those grape varieties and its, and its heritage, but um, it's, it's really interesting to think about, you know, is that a, a characteristic of the region and the, and the, the Piedmont? Um, and it's just such a fantastically um, complex wine for, for a, a humble price point. Mm -hmm. And Stephen, I think I learned this from you. I mean, Grignolino, if I'm not mistaken, used to fetch similar prices as Barolo pre pre or back in its heyday. Yes, um, you know, there's records here dating back to the 15, 1600s, uh, where yes, it was it was this and Fresa as well were um, on par. Barolo had not really taken over the scene. In fact, Nebbiolo had kind of started to lose a little uh, of its fashion because. Uh, we're starting to lose out to some of these other varietals because it was so tannic and difficult to manage. And these wines, you could actually get some uh, real bright fruit notes. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a long history here. Le learning about Italian wine is fascinating uh, because there's so many hidden gems that uh, have been in Italy and have been rediscovered in Italy. And I mentioned the phylloxera earlier. If, you, if you're not aware of that, it's a it's a small bug, a mite that came from the New World and destroyed the vines, the, the roots specifically of the Venice vinifera plants, the, the grape vines here in, there in Europe. Uh, but also it was compounded by this happening at the same time that the Industrial Revolution was happening and, and then two world wars. And it really sort of devastated these indigenous varietals that are now, after the 60s, have only started to kind of climb their way back. Uh, but they felt, faced more um, problems with the popularity of certain French varietals like Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Cabernet Sauvignon, and uh, and even Pinot Grigio has dominated the market in uh, in Italy. But uh, there's just so a wealth of, of of new, unique varietals to discover, and this has been one of my absolute favorite wines to discover from Italy. Uh, thank you for joining us today in exploring the wine of Santa Caterina with their uh, Grinolina da Asti called Arlandino.